initially probably an hour or so. I, I didn't leave them on a, enough, long enough, when I first fired it up and I blew a fuse. They, they arced over inside and uh, the mercury had not vaporized yet. But now you'd only hit, it says on the, uh, it says on the control box to uh, apply filament power 15 seconds before plate power. <laughs> now, uh, once the mercury is vaporized, you can, it, uh, you know, it doesn't have to warm up too long. You can actually see the mercury in the tubes. Some of it is along the uh, inside of the envelope, but a lot of it is down below here. Um, the transmitter weighs 110 pounds. The power supply is 77 pounds of that. And the, the majority of that is the high voltage power transformers. In uh, 1934, the uh, magnetics, uh, the, the, uh, the permeability of the uh, laminations in the, in the uh, transformers was not very good. Uh, they didn't have uh, high permeability material at that time. They probably didn't know anything about it. Consequently, the power supplies are very heavy and physically, they're very la the transformers are very large. This has a, uh, a filament transformer um, for the rectifiers, a separate filament transformer for these two tubes, two and a half volt rectifiers. It has a uh, low voltage rectifier tube, a 5Z3. So it has a pow a pow and a power transformer for the low voltage and uh, filaments on that and then there's a choke for the high voltage and there's two chokes underneath here for the low voltage supply. Uh, you can see in the photograph that I passed on to you what the chassis looked like originally. Uh, I can tip this a little bit, I think, and hopefully still get it back up. You can see the underside of the uh, power supply. The uh, capacitors that are in there are oil-filled. They're non-polar, oil-filled, made by Aerovox in New Bedford, and they leak. They, uh, they leak oil, and they were leaking when I got it. And I was thinking about rebuilding it, and the, in order to maintain the uh, originality of it, I was planning to open up the capacitors, pull the guts out, clean them all out, and put modern day electrolytics inside. But I figured, well, I'll try it. I mean, the worst thing that'll happen is I'll have ripple on the power supply. So when, once I fired the power supply up, I put it on a scope, and the ripple was surprisingly low. So I said, hell, I'll just leave them alone. <laughs> so I haven't changed it, but they are still leaking oil. They've pr probably been leaking for 70 years. I mean, this thing's almost oh. 70 years old now. The fact that it had no coils on it, that was presenting a problem. I, I had a photograph of what the coils looked like. I had no coil form, so I robbed, the, the, for the tank circuit, I robbed a coil form out of an old transmitter that I had, and I just, wound, you know, I just kind of guessed as to how many turns to put on it for 80 meters. This is an 80 meter coil for the oscillator. And uh, I had no schematic on it, but uh, W5EU sent me a schematic of a 160 meter coil. So I had something to, to start with anyway. This is an 80 meter coil wound on a coil farm that I was able to pick up at the flea market. Since then, I have, on eBay, I bought a coil two coils from a 30FXB, which is a big brother of this transmitter, stands six foot high. The coil configuration is not the same, but the coil form is. So I plan to rewind this coil on an original uh, Collins coil form. They're ceramic. I use the uh, Bakelite coil. But since then, in uh, trying to uh, get them to look original, uh, I uh, went down to my local hardware store and I found the tailpiece for a sink drain worked perfect for a coil farm. Uh, it just so happens a tube socket from an old tube fits, press fits into the base of it. So this is uh, going to be uh, my version of a Collins coil. This, this, this one I wound for 80 meters on the tailpiece so you can see what it could, looks pretty much like the original. Trying to get this thing to oscillate without any schematics, it, it, was, it was luck. I, I wound coils, fi uh, use a grid dip meter, and I finally got the oscillator working. So it's crystal control. This is a crystal for 39, uh, 
uh, this is for 75 meters up the upper portion of the phone band. <coughs> yeah, they use two tubes in parallel for the oscillator. And these are the two oscillator tubes. I guess they figured they may not get enough drive out of a single tube. <coughs> but I tried it with a single tube and it seems to work okay. Uh, they, these two are the oscillator tube. These two are the buffer multiplier. If you uh, operate on 40 meters, you start off on 80 and you double to 40. <coughs> Here's the uh, coil for the buffer. And it has a, uh, like a tickler winding on it that was, took a lot of uh, guesswork to get it working. Finally was able to get it to drive the final. When I got this thing, all, the only tube I got with it was the final, the 211, which is this big tube back here. You can see it without the coil in it. <coughs> this is the 211. It lights up very brilliantly. That has a 10 volt filament on it. Um, now, I get the thing operating on CW and over straight key night, uh, July, uh, uh, July, yeah, January, January stations uh, up and down the coast on ADCW and uh, uh, sent out special QSL cards with the photograph of the old rig on it. <coughs> Now, it runs about 120 watts output on CW. Uh, for phone, Collins elected to use grid modulation with it. Uh, the, the only problem with grid modulation is it's a low-level lo low modulation, and it's inefficient by virtue of the fact that you go from like 100 watts plus, uh, maybe 120 watts, down to 45 watts. So. Uh, I had no idea or no schematic or anything on a grid modulator that went with this unit. So what I did was I took the photograph that was in the uh, Collins ads and I'll pass. This is from a 1935 QST and this is the Collins ad on the front page. This is uh, from the Collins uh, website, the Collins Collector's website. Uh, I took the photograph <clears throat> enlarged it and kind of guessed as to what the layout was. I knew what the tube layout was because it described it in one of the uh, ads that they had. So uh, I ended up replicating a Collins 7X modulator and this is the end result. Um, in, in this box is the input tube. The mic goes right into the grid of the input tube which has a grid cap right on the top. No resistor or anything. It just goes right into it. And the schematic, I obtained that from a um, 1936 Jones uh, handbook. Uh, just happened to have a, a, a circuit of an audio amplifier in there that had the same tubes as the tube lineup. And this is what it, what it ended up it uh, starts out with a 57 tube, which is in here, driving a 56, driving a 2A3. And this is a rectifier tube. The modulation transformer is a 5 watt audio output transformer. These two transformers, by the way, were in, in the pile of junk that I got from this guy. Just so happened they looked just like what was in the photograph of the modulator. Now, uh, I built this thing up and hooked a loudspeaker onto the output of it, and it worked. I couldn't believe it. Uh, it. I figured I'd have diddled around with the thing to get it working after a fashion. So then, to try to figure out how to hook it up to the transmitter, because here again, I had no schematic, no, no books on how, you know, from Collins. So I came up with a scheme of a resistor and the grid circuit. There is a grid supply in here, by the way, a, a bias supply and uh, hooked the, I hooked the modulator up through this lead and um, got on the air with it on 75 meters and my first contact was WA1HLR or WA1HLR and he told me the audio sounded beautiful and uh, I get excellent audio reports out of the thing uh, several people have told me it sounds like hi-fi so that, that was my experience in getting it on phone. Um, I'm going to pass another couple of photographs around here. Uh, 